of us and uh, this morning um, it's just neat to meet together again it's, it's um my heart rejoices when we come together i know that last week thank you uh last week we were Um, we, we did church a little bit differently uh, through Facebook Live, um, but this morning we have an opportunity to come back together again, and I just think there's something to be said. You know, the early church looked forward to actually coming together um, to the point where the writer to the Hebrews reminds the church, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Because, look, um, we can all be blessed by watching from home. Um, and there are circumstances where, you know, I know that many people are, you know, still concerned about the environment, and that's okay. Listen, um, this is between you and the Lord. But there's something to be said when we come together and we're able to minister to each other because. In the apostolic ministry, there is freedom in order to share with one another. And so the community of, of Jesus Christ uh, comes and shares. We're not only coming to receive, we definitely need to receive. Uh, listen, every time I come into the Lord's house, I'm receiving. I'm receiving from the Lord. I'm receiving from you what you have, you know, to offer in a, in a prophetic word, you know, in prayer. Um, I receive as well. Uh, and this is what the community of Jesus Christ is about, that we're actively participating in each other. So we can certainly be blessed by a stream, by a live stream, but there are just some things that you cannot gain from a stream and uh, being uh, you know, physically separated. So I just wanted to share that with you. It is important that um, we remember the assembling of ourselves. Okay. This morning, as we're speaking about the fivefold ministry of the church, we've been on this topic for a while. And I wanted to point something out this morning as we speak about specifically the teaching ministry, the teachers, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists. We've spoken about the covering of an apostolic ministry, the freedom that is afforded in releasing the giftings. Then we talked about the apostle, and we said that the apostle focuses on heaven, while the prophetic ministry is the one that interprets what the apostle is seeing. And this is how we all work together. This morning we want to speak about specifically the teaching ministry. Paul says, first apostles, then prophets, third teachers. And as I said concerning the prophet, that when the Lord said first apostles and second pro uh, prophets, he wasn't saying that one is less anointed than another. He's just saying that there is a place and a structure in which the apostolic ministry comes together. And this morning, third teachers, he's not saying that the teaching ministry is less productive, less valuable in the giftings than the other ones, but it has its, its place in, in, in the way that the mantle goes forward in the anointing. And when we take one anointing out of context from the other anointings, and we just generalize that one anointing and specifically emphasize actually that one anointing, what happens is we create an environment that is not conducive to the actual flow of the Holy Spirit freely. And so this morning as we teach about the teaching ministry, I just want to bring that out to us, that we're not just looking at, a, a, at, at an anointing that is greater than another anointing, but it has its place. And when it has its place, it is profitable and, and it edifies the church of Jesus Christ. And so I want you this morning to turn 
with you to Luke chapter 9. Turn with your Bibles, if you have it, to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read a few passages here in the beginning to establish a foundational point in which we can base uh, this morning the, uh, the Word of God. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Look at what he says here. It says, Then he, being Jesus, called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So the Lord releases this anointing over his disciples. And then look at what verse 2 says. It says, And he sent them to do what? to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He didn't just send them to teach and preach the kingdom of God, but it is a twofold release here. He's, he sends them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now turn with me, if you will, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6 and verse 7. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6 and verse 7. I want to emphasize this same theme and idea that we've just expressed. Chapter 6, look at verse 7. And it says, And he, being Jesus, called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits, okay? The Lord commissioned them with authority. Now look at verse 12 and 13. So they went out and did what? They preached, interchangeably would teach, okay? That people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. What did they do? Jesus commissioned them to go out they went out, they taught the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God was like, what the kingdom of God said, what the, how the kingdom of God was established, and then they revealed the kingdom of God by, by uh, the, the works and the miracles that followed up after their teaching. And now I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 through 8. Matthew, chapter 10. And we're going to bring this to full circle now all together. Matthew chapter 10. Beginning with verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look at this, verse seven. And as you go, preach, teach, okay? Saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, Freely you have received, freely give out. Freely you have received, freely give out. Go out, preach and teach the kingdom of God. Talk about what the kingdom of God is like. Bring the power of the kingdom of God then into reality and begin to heal the sick. Cast out the demons. Everything that is contrary to the kingdom of God that you have just taught, that you've just, that you've just preached about, that you've just brought out, that you, you're explaining out to the people. Now show them, give them a visual sign of what the kingdom is about so that the kingdom of God has been set into active motion, into a demonstration of what it is like. Listen, teaching without active demonstration of power reveals a kingdom in theory 
without the confirmation or the affirmation of truth. Let me repeat it. Teaching without the active demonstration of power reveals a kingdom in theory without affirmation or confirmation of truth. Listen, the one thing that the, that the children know, and many of us know that have gone you know, to school and we've sat in a classroom, we've, we've sat in colleges, we've sat in, in lecture halls, is that when they, uh, the, 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 the education department presents something, the teacher presents something to the students, it's more than just, you know, receiving information. It's that we receive the information and we're able to take it and put it into practice. Somebody say amen. amen. So this is the way it is with the kingdom of God. It is more than just receiving head knowledge, receiving knowledge of what the Bible says, receiving knowledge of what Jesus did, receiving knowledge of how the early church uh, um, uh, prospered, receiving knowledge of how the prophets spoke out, receiving knowledge of how men and women of faith went forth uh, and did great things uh, for the Lord. It was more than just that, that we would read and have a history lesson of this information. It is that we receive the information and we put it out to use in a place uh, in an environment uh, that is allowed uh, to be free in demonstration so that the truth uh, that we're speaking from the word of God and how many of us can say the word of God is truth come on the word of God is truth come on say it with me the word of God is truth the word of God is truth hallelujah the word of God is absolute truth but if we're, all we're doing is speaking out the word of God without the revelation or the confirmation of what the word of God is saying there is no confirmation to what we're talking about it can only be a lecture or a history lesson for the hearer to understand Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter, he said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, pre to every creature. Preach it out. Teach it out. Give instruction of what the Bible says. Give instruction to the, to, to the, to the, to, to the validity of the scriptures. And then he goes on to say, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. And you know what Jesus was saying here? He's saying, go out and teach. Go out and preach. But if you really believe what you're teaching and you're preaching, these signs will follow. You will see uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit break out around you. We're living in a church culture that has very good teaching. We have tremendous men and women that are able to bring out the word of God. But unless the word of God is followed up with signs and wonders, it is a theory, it is something that is unproven to the person that is receiving the word of God. How many of us know that the word of God is active? Come on, say the word of God is active. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is living. So when the word of God comes out and begins to manifest itself. It's more than just the spoken word. It is the activity that takes place. Heaven comes to earth and begins to release out what is taking place in heaven. The teaching anointing within the fivefold mantle over the church is an active and necessary gifting given for the purpose of instruction in helping the body of Christ to mature in truth. We need to mature in this. But in the Gospels, it is always accompanied with a demonstration of its truth and power. In other words, the supernatural power that followed the teaching validated the truth. How did they know? How did people know that they were listening to the Gospel, that were listening to the message of the cross, that were listening to what these disciples were, were telling them? How did they know that it was truth in comparison to all the other religions, all the other things, all the other worship? acts that were taking place in the culture around them. They saw the signs and wonders. They saw that what the disciples were teaching and what they were preaching was actually something that was, uh, that, that was true and, and something that, that they were able to participate in. We have tremendous teachers in the body of Christ that have a unique gifting to break down scripture and bring in clarity of the word of God into, into, into uh, practical applications. We have men and women that have this gifting, this insight into taking the word of God and just to present it like it's something that is just so easily understood. I, 
I personally love to hear some of the the old, uh, the older uh, preachers and teachers. I, I learn a lot from their teaching ministry. They have tremendous insight. The way they break down the word of God, and not, and not because they yelled when they preached. I know I yell. <laughs> but yelling doesn't bring down the power of God, hello? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit that's supposed to move. But as I listen to some of these fathers, and can I even say mothers, that spoke out the word of God with this clarity and this anointing that took the word of God and made the, the passages of scripture that are so difficult to understand and bring it out to a, a teaching of understanding so that I can receive. I love to hear that. But unless the teaching anointing is part of an apostolic mantle that is accompanied by the supernatural demonstration of the Holy Spirit, it becomes theoretical without the st substantiation of truth. Did you get me? It doesn't matter how great a message that the teacher is teaching, how wonderful to the ear that it might be, how exciting that, you know, some people are just gifted in taking, you know, the word of God and making it so exciting, like you're on an adventure when you're listening to the teacher, right? But unless it's accompanied by the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, to follow. How many times we read in the word of God that when the disciples spoke that the word of God followed up with power and authority. Why? Because the word of God substantiated the message that was going through. And it's not that, you know, sometimes when a, when a teacher speaks and we don't see anything and a teacher speaks and we see something that one teacher is better than another teacher. It's the fact that at times, you know, we need to, as even teachers, allow the Holy Spirit to be demonstrated in what we're saying. Somebody say amen. Come on. Am I with, are you with me this morning? So the American church has accepted the teacher as the highest anointing level of the fivefold mantle with the greatest emphasis and in instruction of scripture that is often without the freedom of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate the word of God. And so the word of God will go forth. And this is prevalent, unfortunately, in the American church at times. We see, you know, great, you know, messages and teachings that go out. And then we give the benediction and we go home to our, our ways. And we don't see anything take place in the word of God. I believe that God wants to manifest himself. God wants to release his authority. God wants to substantiate what, he, what the teaching is about. That we're not just receiving a history lesson. We're not just part of a scheduled period that we come to, but that we are participating in what heaven is doing, what heaven is saying, what heaven wants to do, what heaven wants to release, that we're part of that, and we allow the Holy Spirit to, in order to, 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 to substantiate the word, to release the word in actuality in our lives. Listen, the current church culture has a high value for the security that we feel when we are able to prove what we have devoted our life to. And sometimes, you know, we listen to the teaching, you know, only because we're afraid to be wrong. Come on. Are you with me? Did I make myself clear on that? We listen to the teaching because we're afraid to be wrong. So as long as we listen to the teaching, you know, the teaching is telling us that, you know, this is right. Because, you know, in the teaching, there is this, you know, this laid out argument of what the scripture says, how the scripture is interpreted. And we want to make sure that, the, that we do this on a long-term basis because we want to make sure that we're not wrong along the way. We've built stadiums of teaching ministries with great enthusiasm and gifted insights into the scripture, but without the fivefold anointing to support the teaching and, the, and manifest the power of heaven, we teach a kingdom we cannot prove. 
How'd you get that? With all the teaching, with all the fanciness, with all the, the, the insights of the word of God. When I, I love to, when I study the word to try to get the background of what the author was, was saying in that portion. So when I, when I study the word, I, I keep a, a, a Greek dictionary and, and a, a, um, a Hebrew dictionary next to me to try to bring the words alive. And then I go back and I tr try to study the culture of that time when it was done so that I can get a feel of what's going on. And, you know, you know, as a teacher, you can understand that, that, you know, you, you want to grasp as much as you possibly can from what the scriptures are saying so that we can get that portion of insight. But if all we're doing is bringing this education into our teaching and there is no manifestation of what we're teaching, we cannot prove one thing of what the scriptures are saying. And I know that, you know, we are in, you know, we've been raised in an environment where, you know, we say, well, we receive the scriptures by faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the word of God says. We need the faith. But we need to take that faith and put it into action and allow the Holy Spirit to bring the word of God into reality. Not because God needs to prove himself, but in the word of God, it reveals that we need to prove the word of God. And so as we, what, is the, what does the Bible say? It says to prove every spirit. We, we prove the word of God as it's coming into our life. How do we do it? Not because we doubt it. We prove it by taking what the word of God is saying, what the teaching has been brought out, and we put it into practice in our daily lives. The Western culture church often chooses teachers based on their ability to argue the scriptures to logical conclusions, right? We don't want to have a message and then at the end of the message saying, oh, I, I don't really know, you know what this really means. You take it, you, you, know, you figure it out. Could you imagine? Could you imagine, you know, going to, to school, guys, and your teacher presents an argument, and then, you know, or a teaching, and then at the end of the at the end of the classroom period, the teacher says, I, I don't really know if this is true or not, so you take it and you know, you prove it. Right? But don't we do that sometimes with the word of God? We want a logical conclusion to everything that we're studying. And so what makes the word of God so infinite, so powerful, so mystical, is that there is nothing humanly logical about it. In natural understanding, God and his word are illogical without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring the power into revelation. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. What is he saying? He's saying that many times the things that we think are, you know, just the, this, this, this great conclusion of things, you know, with that we're satisfied with but God is taking the things that we don't understand the things that we're saying are foolish God is, is, is empowering those things God is saying there is depth in there God is saying there is there is infinite knowledge in his word the fact is that uh, that our need for so much certainty comes from uncertainty we need to be certain because we're so uncertain with all the teaching that we receive we need to be more certain than than, than we were before when heaven stops manifesting itself in the church, Christians need to prove their reasoning for following Jesus. Did you get that? When heaven stops manifesting itself in the church, we need a reason to believe the Bible, is what we're saying. And so they view the teacher as the one who will provide that reasoning with convincing instruction. And so rather than taking the word of God 
and allowing the word of God to be manifest, to be real, to be something that is part of our lives as we walk it out, as we're proving it out. I was listening one time to a pastor saying that when he first got saved, he and his friend, well, when he first got saved, the first thing he did was he went to witness to his friend and brought him to Jesus. And there was so much fire to serve God inside of them that they thought they would do something absolutely impossible. They waited till one o'clock in the morning to break into a funeral home and they began to pray over the dead, to raise the dead. <laughs> he said, he said, none of the dead came alive. He said, but what was important was the fact that we had the zeal inside of us to prove the word of God in our life. And what happens is in our culture, we hear the word. Listen, we're living, especially in our generation, we're living in an environment where, I mean, you can get the word of God in any which way. In, 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 in yesterday's generation, you know, you had to physically be somewhere to get the word, you know, in teaching. But today you can turn on your, your iPhone, your laptop in a stream, or, uh, you know, on TV they've got, all sorts of you know programmings, Christian programmings to get it. And we're getting all of this teaching, 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 teaching. And because we receive it so easily that we become we rely on somebody or some ministry to feed us so that we don't have to go out and do it ourselves. Are you with me, church? And so we'll turn on a stream and hear a wonderful message, a wonderful teaching. And then when we're finished, we could just turn it off and go through our normal day. And when this takes precedence in the Christian's life, we become lazy in the things of God. You know why we talk about the early church so much? They weren't perfect. And they had their problems. Read through, I, I'm reading through the letters to the Corinthians or to the Galatians. And the apostle Paul was, he was driving it home. They had some serious issues in the church. But you know why we hold the early church into such a, 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 an elevated level of worship? It's because they heard the word. They were simple enough to hear what the teachers were saying and then saying, I'm going to go out and I'm going to take part in what I just heard. And so you would hear of you know, people being baptized with each other. You would hear people praying for the sick and being healed. You would hear for other, for you know, ministers, Peter, going to jail and the entire church would come together and begin to pray. And, and, and an angel appears in, in the prison house and, and, and releases Peter in front of all the guards that were sleeping at that time. The, uh, why? Because it was more about being a participant. And so the teaching ministry is important in the five-fold ministry, not because we're holding it into such a high level and this is where we are and this is what we need to do. We need to learn more. We need to do more. We need to be able to, you know, get better teaching or, or great, greater teaching or, you know, I wonder what this sermon is going to be like or that teaching is going to be like. Instead of saying, I, I, I'm receiving something and I need to put this into practice. When the, gospel, when the power of the gospel is replaced by arguments, everyone should be concerned. When healing from disease and deliverance from demonic control follow teaching and preaching of the kingdom of God, we don't require arguments. You know what the greatest message is? Let me tell you what the greatest message was. 
when Peter and John were walking to the temple that day and they saw a lame man that, that was begging in the streets. The greatest sermon. The greatest sermon. With all the messages that Peter and John must have preached to the churches, the greatest sermon took place in that moment. When they took the kingdom of God and brought it down into a man that was lame. Teaching requires the demonstration. Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven follow, and followed the teaching with demonstration of what the kingdom looks like. In Matthew chapter 9 it says, Then Jesus went out into all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among the people. I, I love what pastor and author Bill Johnson says. He says, Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is perfect theology. You know what the problem is with our theology to, so often? It's marred. It's, and can I say it? At times it's even corrupt. But Jesus is perfect theology. Amen. Hey, if it was good for Jesus, it should be good for the church. So what, did Jesus, what does Jesus tell his disciples to do? Remember, in verse 35, he's, he's going out into the cities and villages. He's teaching what the kingdom is like. And then he's releasing the kingdom of God into their midst. What does he tell his disciples to do? Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10. He says, and as you go, preach. Or in other words, teach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Teach the kingdom of God is present. In your personal environment. That it's real. That it's for now. Teach that it is for this moment. That on earth as it is in heaven. And then demonstrate what scripture says through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead cast the demons freely you've received freely you need to give out Amen. there's a lot of teaching today that sounds great wonderful themes themes that we can grow with and be edified with. But sometimes we, 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 uh, we keep those type of sermons that are uplifting for the church environment. And when we go out into the street, we're finding people that are broken. Families that are broken. People that are broken in their health. People that are broken in their minds. And we're trying to give them sometimes, you know, a teaching that has absolutely nothing to where they are in that moment. What, what the Lord is saying here is preach the kingdom of God. What God is saying. What heaven is saying. And then release it into their lives. When they don't understand anything else about your church. About the, about your, uh, the things that, you know, that you're saying uh, in, your, in your spiritual dialogue. When they don't understand anything about that. And you tell them about the kingdom of God. Then show them what the kingdom of God is about. A person with the touch of heaven is the full proof of who Jesus is in their life. You want to prove Jesus? Show them what heaven is like, allowing heaven to touch into their lives. We need teachers to operate under the unction of the Holy Spirit in their gifting and have the support of the fivefold anointing and to release to them the heaven and the truth that is spoken by the word of God through the teacher. When the church insists on having a logical culture, we demand a logical gospel and we turn to teachers to create a logical understanding of scripture. Because we want something that's logical, something we can understand, something we can control, something that we can say, you know, this is real because my teacher said so. In the process, it produces a one-dimensional body that only knows how to receive knowledge, but without experiencing the supernatural, and we develop crowds instead of leaders. If knowledge of scripture is not accompanied by heaven, response in people's lives with the reflection of the kingdom that we teach, the culture of the church body is turned to the law-based doctrine.
Why do we criticize so often what we see as so structured and limited in the Old Testament? We say, oh, they were under the law. Oh, this is law. Oh, they, they, they had to observe and walk through the commandments. You know, they were restricted. But sometimes we create an environment that looks a lot different from the eyesight of what they had in the Old Testament. But we're doing the same thing. We're taking people and placing them under the law. You just listen. You just be obedient to these laws. When the Holy Spirit is saying, each person is my vessel. Each person has my anointing. Each person has my gifting. Each person comes together to release it so that as the teacher teaches the word, that it's not about the teaching or how well he presented it, but it's about receiving and putting out, bringing out what God has said. I'm going to stop here. It's a lot of information. But I want to close with this. Would you stand with me this morning? When Jesus taught a crowd about the kingdom of heaven, he always showed them the kingdom. He didn't just tell them about the kingdom. He showed them the kingdom. His disciples were in a constant classroom of experience. Could you imagine being one of Jesus' disciples? You didn't just hear somebody speak and preach, and Jesus had a tremendous anointing in his teaching. The greatest anointing. But as he spoke, he comes across blind Bartimaeus. And I know that, you know, he must have, the Bible doesn't say this, but I'm just kind of visioning this. He kind of looks at his disciples and says, let me show you what the kingdom of God is like. And he speaks into blind Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus receives his sight. Jesus is walking down the street and he sees a funeral procession. A young man being brought over to his grave. His mother weeping and crying out that she has no more support of a loved one by her. What does Jesus do? He stops what he's doing. He stops the profession. And he raises the young man back to life. Jesus is walking through a crowd. And there's a woman with an issue of blood. She's been to doctors. She's wasted everything that she has on modern medicine. And, you know, he's preaching the kingdom. He goes to the synagogues and he speaks. He holds great crusades with people. She reaches for the hem of his garment. Come on, we talked about this last week. When she touched that hem of his garment, the blue strand that was around there, she was reminded of all the promises that Jesus had for her life. His disciples were in a constant classroom experience, watching the kingdom in the real life demonstration prepared before them. And so that they would preach that gospel to the New Testament church and in the same way show them, new believers, what the kingdom was like. What good is a conference or a convention or a worship service if there is great teaching and nothing to back it up experientially? What good is it if we're receiving but we never put out? Isn't that the reason that the Holy Spirit comes to rest on us? Because if we're not, what difference do we have 
with Old Testament Israel that just brought their sacrifices and then went back to their old ways. We have an anointing of the Holy Spirit to release the giftings inside of us. Would you bow your heads? I pray that this morning we didn't just receive another teaching. I pray that this morning that the Holy Spirit is released to substantiate and prove the Word of God. I pray that this morning that we're not just the people that are sitting back receiving, but we are disciples being trained up that when we hear about what the kingdom of God is like, it's not a foreshadowing of when we get to heaven and then see it in reality. But it is an opportunity to take what Jesus has just told us and release it. So this morning, I know that may not be conducive to just, you know, going around and praying for one another, but I'm just going to release you right now to allow the word of God that just came out to have his effect on you and on someone else that the Holy Spirit is speaking to. If you feel that, you know, you just want to go in the vicinity of someone and that the Lord has spoken to you about someone here and you have a word, a word of encouragement, a word of direction, that this morning we're just allowing the Holy Spirit to flow freely. If you heard something this morning that gripped your heart to the point in which you're saying, I don't want to be a spectator. I want to be a participant. I want to just release you to allow the kingdom of God to break out. In your anointing, maybe you have an apostolic anointing this morning and you need to step out in it. A prophetic anointing this morning, you need to step out in it. A teaching anointing this morning, step out in it. An evangelistic anointing this morning, step out of it. Step out into your anointing. Step out into faith. Allow the kingdom of God to be a reality and not a history show. Father, I release your people into the word that you spoke out this morning. That it will be the reality of the kingdom in, in practice.